Next little short item. I've got to be careful that I run out of time. Oil. I don't know how many of you watch, but the price of oil has really collapsed in the last few days. It's very important that you understand it's a basic commodity in the world. Why is that happening? That's the important thing. It's happening for two reasons. And we like this in economics because it's nice and neat. It's because of the supply and it's because of the demand. First, the supply. The biggest addition to supply is the United States. Fracking produces a quantity of oil and gas that is huge and is just being pushed into the world market and is more than enough than to drown out whatever cutbacks in producing oil might happen in the Middle East or Africa or Venezuela because of the problems those countries have. And the end result is there's too much oil being attempted to be sold. By itself, that probably wouldn't have made a big difference, some. But it's happening together with, and this is the important thing, a decrease in demand. Why? Because the global economic system is slowing down. We are headed into a time of major economic decline and trouble. Some of you have asked me in previous months to give more <laughs> advice that will help you decide what stocks to buy or not to <laughs> buy. Uh, there are laws that prevent me, by the way, from doing that, and, and they're good laws in the sense that without knowing your circumstances, anybody gives you advice, you, you just stop talking to that person because everybody's situation is unique and the advice you get should be based on a real knowledge of your situation, what you want, what you have, and so on. The only stops you if you collect money for doing it. You can feel free to tell us whatever you want as long as you don't make us pay for it. Well, that's not what BAI tells me. I've been told not to ever, ever do that. Anyway, it's another conversation. Um, okay, so the demand. The slowdown in the economy is for three basic reasons. But actually, before I tell you what the reasons are, let me tell you, make sure you understand. That's not me that's saying the economy is going to slow down. You live in a society that has a serious set of psychological problems. You already know that. I am now going to tell you about some others you might not have known about. Right? We live in an economy in which a dominant position in the media is held by the political leadership, as you can see, even Mr. Trump. It's in the interest of whoever is running the company to say that the economy is either doing wonderfully or about to doing wonderfully or recovering so that it will do wonderfully shortly. That wonderfully is the, uh, the key word. Therefore, if it is in fact doing badly, they're going to tell you with more in intensity how wonderful it is. Or, to use another more technical term, there's going to be a lot of denial going on. Which is understandable because who wants to say or face the fact that economic circumstances are deteriorating? You already have enough financial problems. You don't want to hear that more are coming. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, more are coming. But it's not just me. Three, I'm going to just give you three of many sources. Because the disconnect these days, these last few months, between the financial press, which I read as a part of my job, and the public media press that you all, the gap between them is, I've never seen it like this. So over the last two months, just to pick three, UBS uh, used to be the Union Bank of Switzerland, one of the great banks in the world. Uh, they've just announced that one of their leading funds they, they take money from rich people, basically, and they create funds which they then invest for those rich people to become richer still, which seems to be an important uh, desire on the, on the part of those kinds of people. Uh, I don't see anyone nodding, so I guess there's none of them here. Um, the uh, UBS just announced uh, yesterday that in its major fund, it is reducing, I'll use their language, reducing the exposure to equities that means the proportion of their fund invested in stocks, from 50% to 20%. Now, you only do that if you think that the excrement is about to fly into the cooling equipment. Right? That's what you... Yeah. That's good. I didn't, I didn't expect it. That's like Trump when he was lecturing to the UN. He didn't expect them to be laughing at him. Um, I hope you're laughing with me. Um, <laughs> another example, 
uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, that's the largest bank in the United States now, J.P. Morgan Chase. They've predicted, which is really nutty to do, but gives you an idea, that we will have a downturn by early 2020. That's less than 18 months from now. Okay? And Goldman Sachs is already advising its clients to move from equities to fixed income and only the most secure cautious kinds of fixed income and to hold an increasing amount of cash. You know, cash doesn't pay interest and cash doesn't get you dividends. What cash gets you is safety. And they're worried. They don't want you even to buy treasury securities because they expect those to go down and fairly sharply too. So if UBS and Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan Chase think the economy is turning down, then it's not me uh, uh, saying it. It's a consensus of the people whose job it is to invest money for rich people based on what they think is going to happen in the economy. And they think the stock market is going down because the underlying economy is in deep trouble. Being made worse by the inability of the United States to face anything. Imagining that if you put tariffs against the Chinese and others, it will kind of not matter. Well, it does matter. The Chinese are kicking back. The Chinese are taking all kinds of steps to escape this. And they're doing a pretty good job of it, too. The New York Times cheers that Chinese are really suffering. By the way, they are suffering. But they're doing their share of, of pushing that suffering back on the United States. That too hurt Mr. Trump in the elections. This is a society not facing its problems, denying that it has these problems. The worst thing you could do in this situation is to raise interest rates. Why? Because it makes it more expensive to buy a car, so people will do less of it. It makes it more expensive to buy a home, so people will do less of it. It makes it more expensive to use your credit card, so people will do less of it. It makes it more expensive to borrow to go to college, so people will do less of it. That's not good for the economy. None of that is. Yet they're going to do it. The next interest rate increase is scheduled for December. The Federal Reserve has said it will do that December. That's not very far away, folks. Why would a country have to do that? Because it's got so many problems it has to deal with that way that it can't afford not to do it even though not doing it is kind of what you ought to do. That's when a society is in real trouble, when it has major economic problems and it can't find a way out. It starts to then behave in desperate ways. Let me give you an example of one of the most desperate. We've just had 30 years in which the gap between rich and poor has gotten much sharper in the United States, in which the top 10% have basically taken all of the productivity gains, all of the increase in output into their own hands with everybody else kind of treading water. So you come to December 2017 and you have the rich have gotten much, much richer and everybody else is kind of squeezed. What any half-witted person would understand this is not the time that you give a mammoth tax cut to the rich. They don't need it. And there's 10,000 other things more urgent in this society than to do that. But they did that. And they didn't just do it because Trump believes in it or because the Republicans controlled the Congress. That certainly helped, made it possible to do it quickly. But they did it because they have a basic problem. They don't want an economic downturn. And they are desperate. We barely got out of the last one. How are you going to rationalize to the American people that we just had a crash in 28, 28, then we had 10 years of austerity and difficulty, and at the end of that, we're going to give you another shot, another downturn. I mean, you're starting to stretch the credulity, the stretch the toleration of an economic system that works like this. So they can't do that. They need to give this economy another boost. So they did. They cut taxes for corporations, you all remember, from 35% to 21%. 
They cut taxes for rich people, and they even cut taxes for the average person. And to really boost the economy, they increased government spending on a whole bunch of social programs at the same time. Well, you all know, or you should, that if the government takes in much less money, that's what a tax cut is, while it spends more, uh, it's got to get that money that it's spending more somewhere, and it's not getting it from its revenue, so what the government did is borrow. So the, the deficit went up crazy. This is the deficit went up staggeringly, and it was done by the Republicans, who for the last 20 years have been the big fighters against deficits. Suddenly all of that disappeared. Now this is not about they're not telling the truth or they don't, they're, of course they don't. They're politicians in America, what do you expect? But that doesn't answer the question, why did they do that? Well they did it because they got to keep this crazy system going and it's not easy to do. You got to give it an enormous boost. And UBS, Goldman and JP Morgan Chase, that's their argument. We're going to go down in 2019 and 2020 because we're going to run out of the little juice we got from the December 2017 tax. And the underlying reality is terrible. And once that juice up passes, once it's spent, we're back to where we were, only even harder because we have an enormous deficit which we're afraid could come and haunt us, which is why the interest rates are going up to make the cost of that deficit more expensive, right? If we owe, the United States owes $20 trillion, roughly, in its debt, if the interest rates go up, then the government has to generate more money each year to pay interest on that debt. Where's that money gonna come from? That's right, they're gonna tax you. Or they're gonna cut the public services to free up the money to use now to pay to whoever owns the federal debt, which is mostly wealthy people. Whoa, whoa. These are, these, are, these are dead end choices. Each one is worse than the next one. This is an economy in terrible, difficult circumstances. I think I've told you the story in the past, but I'll tell it again. I, uh, because I went to the fancy universities here in the United States, all the right ones. I did. I did. <laughs> Because of that, I know all these people. It's a small circle. Uh, sitting next to me in my PhD classes at Yale, where I got my PhD, one of my classmates there was a woman named Janet Yellen. Okay? One of my teachers was a... Uh, well, anyway, it's not important. I know all those people, and they know me, and occasionally we get together for a drink or have dinner. And we have, in the last few months, had a remarkable time. We don't agree on how the country got into this situation. We never did agree. And we don't agree how to get out of it. And we never did. But we sit there and we look at each other and we are astonished, each of us in turn, by the fact that there is something we agree on. And here's what it is. That the United States has not been in this bad an economic situation ever before in our lifetimes. That we agree on. And then we resume disagreeing on why it's like that and what to do about it. But I think it's remarkable that we agree on that. And I think it's a sign that it, there's a lot more that you ought to be worried about here than perhaps has um, 